What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. In this one, we're doing an FPL Q&A for game week 30. Now, what I've done in this is ask the people who are signed up to the Let's Talk FPL Patreon to get their questions in. I've tried to keep it non-team specific. So no, should I transfer this player to that player? What should we do with this player, etc.? Um, I've kind of ignored all them for good reason because a lot of them will be in the game week preview, which I'll do next week as normal. And obviously you'll be able to get your questions and topics in on Twitter as well so this one's more um not generic but there's kind of a broader scope to the answers thinking about the end of the season mistakes to avoid things about the template five players to pick and stuff like that as well so loads of questions to be answered in this one uh, and like i said i'll have the normal content all next week uh, as well so you're not going to be missing out on anything so do give it a like if you enjoy it hit subscribe if you're new around here let's jump into the first question so i'm just gonna like free answer these okay i've got a few notes but not too much i just want to kind of do it off the cuff i might ramble a little bit i apologize normal content we're back next week anyway it's the international break right we can do what we want so the first question is interesting because this has been talked about a lot on twitter about you know differential captain picks going against the template there's the whole classic and you always have to tweet this with a thumb emoji play your own game everyone always says that right you take a hit that nine times out of ten doesn't work you've taken like 50 hits this season that haven't worked but you've taken that one hit that does and then you get to tweet play your own game right and what people mean by play your own game is obviously don't listen to other people right if a player is highly captained you don't think they're they're worth it you go against the grain and absolutely we can all agree you should definitely do that right fpl is a simple game you just pick the player that is going to score the most points easy as that and if that player is highly owned great if they're low owned great right if, if anything the lower owned player is probably better but this first question is Towards the end of the season, is it worth going against template teams in order to try something different, assuming you're aiming to beat your friends, or is it not worth taking big risks? So I'm going to answer this from kind of two perspectives, even though the answer is kind of the same, for people going for mini leagues and people going for rank. And I suppose the mini leagues one is slightly different. So we'll talk about the rank one first. And I've said this all season. I said this pre-season. You should not go different for different sake right you need to take calculated risks and it's very difficult to give generic advice from now until the end of the season to do this to do that because every week you know there could be a player injured that affects the team right you could have a, a player that plays himself into form whatever it might be they start taking more shots or something like that suddenly they're a different option than they are right now so it's hard to give generic advice but to give you an idea i have not captained a player outside of Liverpool, Man United, Man City, Spurs, and Arsenal. I kept in Aubameyang the first two game weeks of the season. Never, no, no Arsenal players since... Um, and may, you know who knows they got good fixtures for the rest of the season the only other player I've captained is Patrick Bamford in game week 25 because he had a double game week right so I am not being different for different sake I'm captain in the top teams or the players from the top teams because they tend to get the most points right very simple I even looked at some uh, people on Twitter who are um mavericks whatever you want to call them upside chasers and stuff like that and even they have very rarely gone outside of the traditional top six teams and i fully appreciate the traditional top six is kind of gone now but we'll just call them that for the sake of people knowing what i mean All right and they might have gone for like a defender like a Cancelo over a De Bruyne or a Gundogan. Uh, they might have gone for Werner, for example, or Havertz. Uh, but they're still back in like Chelsea over like a West Ham or a West Brom or whoever it might be. So e even people that are kind of trying to be a bit different are still c being calculated in their risk. For example, recently, I got rid of Bruno Fernandes. Did I go to a West Brom midfielder or a Sheffield United midfielder? Of course I didn't. That would be crazy. I went to Kevin De Bruyne, arguably the best midfielder in the league. And I took that calculated gamble that for a couple of weeks he would outscore Fernandes. And he did. I took a risk that in the game week when everyone would captain Gundogan that he would outscore Gundogan. And he did. But I'm not doing that on some random player. I'm doing it on Kevin De Bruyne. Okay? This week, for example, game week 30, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, Kane and Son, hopefully Son's fit, play Newcastle, right? A pretty good fixture. Lots of people will captain Kane. If you think he is a great pick, you should you should pick him. It doesn't matter that everyone else is going to as well. If you want to back a Chelsea player against West Brom, perfect. If you want to back a Leeds player against Sheffield United, absolutely fine. They are calculated gambles. You're gambling that 
those players are in pretty good teams. They're very attacking. Like Leeds might be further down the table than the top six, but they are they are an extremely attacking side, one of the best in the league, in fact. So Rafinha and Bamford could be good options if you want to take that risk or that gamble. And I think I think even calling it a risk is a is bad phrasing because as soon as you use the word risk, you're you're telling yourself there's a problem with that pick. You're I, even calculated gamble. That's that's kind of what it is. It's a calculated gamble that Kane will get you points. Bamford and Rafinha will probably get you points as well. You're taking that gamble that they outscore Kane. If they don't, okay, if you own Kane, you're probably not that that bad off. If Kane was playing West Brom at home, right, and Bamford was playing Chelsea away, well, that that's more than a calculated risk. That's just a punt, right? And punts can work, and you look like a genius when they do, but when they don't, it, that, which they don't most of the time, there's no, you know, there's no reason to do that move. You know, Bamford against Chelsea and Kane against West Brom at home, they're two completely different um, games, right? And Kane almost certainly is the better pick. Uh, in terms of beating the template, so yeah, just to go on from that, yes, you should do it as long as the player is a good option. I think if you just, as soon as you start calling players a punt, I'm going to punt on this player. Well, why are you doing it? Have they got good underlying numbers? Have they looked threatening on the eye test? Have they got good fixtures? If not, it's literally just a punt and you're just hoping for the best. So when you start hoping for the best, it's probably not going to work. In terms of your friends, the advice is kind of similar. The only difference is you're then only backing against like one or two people rather than millions, okay, or hundreds of thousands. And so you can use tactics such as blocking. So if I've got a Bamiyang in my team and the two people below me have got Fernandez and I'm like 20 points ahead and we and you know that they're going to captain Fernandez. You could just bring Fernandez in and captain him and block them. My only kind of thing I don't like about doing that is you start to lose focus on why you have certain players. And if you're only concentrating on other people's teams, I think you lose focus on the reasons you bought players in or backed against players in the first place. Maybe if it's for a lot of money and it's like later on in the season, there's only a couple of game weeks to go, maybe you could do that. But I would say we're still kind of nine weeks out from the end. That's like a quarter of the season almost to go. Don't change your plans too much. So in, in terms of is it worth taking big risks, I think that, that again, that phrasing is not the way you should think about it. You should just look at, I've got player A. This is the player B that I'm considering. Who's the best option? Bam. Is it a good long-term option? Fixtures. You don't want to transfer a player in them back out, etc. All the usual stuff. So I would just think about it like that. So hopefully that was useful. I hope I didn't ramble too much on this particular question. Uh, but definitely play your own game. But don't go crazy with like crazy punts that you know not are, good, are not going to work. Calculated risks is where it's at. Don't worry, I'm going to make this one quick. It is an advert, but it's an advert for me. If you are into gaming and you want to come and watch me play games, mostly badly, uh, come over to twitch.tv slash let's talk underscore game and hit that follow button. You'll know when I go live there. I should say this is not just another FPL channel. I'm not playing games and talking FPL live. Uh, it's all it's basically anything but FPL. I'm taking a break from FPL by gaming. If you want FPL stuff. There's going to be plenty of content on this channel. So there is a link in the description below, twitch.tv slash let's talk underscore game. And I'll be on later today uh, and tomorrow and probably over the weekend as well. So come and check it out. Hit that follow button. So this is a really good question, right? In pre-season, you made a video called 10 Mistakes to Avoid. Which of these have helped your great rank this season? And would you add any more to the list? So I'll probably do a season review style video uh, at the end of the season. So I won't go into massive, massive detail, uh, but I will talk about some of the mistakes to avoid that I talked about. I will say, right, I'm ranked about 1400th as it stands. There's a lot of the season to go. Like I said just a minute ago for question one, there's still like nine weeks to go. That could easily fall. I could finish outside the top 10K, outside the top 20K. Who knows how the season's going to end. Uh, but one thing I will add before I talk into which, which ones have helped is there is obviously an element of luck. And people hate hearing this because uh, they think if you get a good rank, it's all about skill. And obviously there is some to it. And I don't want to get into the skill versus luck debate because... Um, it's never ending and you shouldn't just write everything off as bad luck either because sometimes you will just make bad decisions look at my season last year for example um but yeah there is an element of luck right bringing in wan Bissaka and david de gea in game week 18 was a good move they had really good fixtures they had a blank and a, they had a game in the blank and they had a game in the double and they had good fixtures afterwards that was a well thought out move but southampton going down to them nine men and wan Bissaka getting a 17 pointer you know, that's a bit of luck, right? Him get, coming out of that game with six, eight points, good planning. Him coming out of it at 17, there's a bit of added good luck there, right? And I think once you realize that you need a little bit of luck to get into a really high rank most seasons, uh, you'll probably feel a bit better about where you are right now. In terms of the 
10 mistakes to avoid that I talked about. Um, I would say, and this is such a cliche, but overthinking and too much noise was one of them. So people, I think sometimes they are looking into FPL so much uh, and they just don't want to make a decision that they go and you know, read as many articles as possible, watch as many videos, listen to as many podcasts, and it gets too much. Everyone's got their own opinion. For example, I, I've, I get a lot of comments, okay, over on Twitter or in the YouTube comments telling me what I am doing is wrong. And I will read them and I will respond to some of them as much as many as I can. But for the most part, I have to ignore it. Because if I make a video now and I say, should I sell Salah? Well, you know what? A lot of people are going to say yes. A lot of people are going to say no. I need to decide why I'm doing that. And I need to stick to that, okay? I've been told not to sell Kane. I've not been told not to sell Son. I listened to some podcasts and stuff about uh, wildcard in Game Week 18. Basically said it was nonsense. You can't go the rest of the season without your wildcard. It's way too early. I ignored all that and went for it. And it worked out. Another season, you know what? Maybe it doesn't, okay? But I think that's one, one thing that's worked is cutting out the noise. If I want to make a choice, then I, I would just do it, okay? And if it's wrong, so be it. doesn't mean I ignore what people say. It's great to get further insight. There's probably something that I've missed. Maybe I've missed that there's a player injury or a difference in tactic that a manager's deployed uh, and I've, not, I've missed it. You know, it does help to listen to other people's opinions. But if you want to sell a player, don't then go onto Twitter and say, should I sell this player? Because you'll get so many different reactions and people will answer based on their team and stuff like that. So too much noise, definitely. Um... Make an early transfer is one, quite a simple one, but that actually hurt me early on in the season. <laughs> Talking about luck, in game week five, or before game week five, I made an early transfer, which hurt because De Bruyne got injured on international duty, and then I had to transfer him out. It was a minus eight. I was like, screw it, I'm just going to wild card. And that wild card really worked out. But ma but making the early transfers, it kind of did hurt me a little bit. Um Chasing differentials, right? One For this video and another one when I did tips, on the tips video I said, um, I'm not going different for the sake of it with my captains. I'm going for tried and tested players. That is what I've done. I've scored quite a few captain points. I think it's about 458 um, in total, which seems kind of decent enough. Uh, and that, like I said, that's all from going for uh, players you know are generally going to score well. It's giving yourself the best chance at points. So Kane, Son, Salah, Fernandez, etc. Right? I'm not going for... Um, you know, I haven't gone for the likes of Trossard or Lingard and fair play to people that did and there was a reason people did that because there wasn't as many fixtures right it makes sense and maybe that's something I need to think about next year uh, but I haven't done those kind of picks in, in other weeks um, lack of planning for sure I feel like I don't it's easy to say that I've done this more because I'm doing well and look maybe next season will be a season like last where I finished like 166k or whatever it was um, but I've really planned with defenders in particular so I had a look kind of five, six weeks ahead at their fixtures. Will I have enough players to play? And then I've trusted them as well. And I've concentrated my transfers on attacking players for the most part. For example, this week or in Game Week 29, I bought in Tierney instead of Regulon because his long-term fixtures were better. And I wasn't going to have to make as many defender transfers. So I've got Tierney, uh, Dawson. I can't remember the other players. Tierney, Dawson, Dallas. Uh, who else am I playing? Rudiger as well. Uh, and I'm not, I can't remember the fifth, fifth defender. I should look it up really. But either way, I know that most weeks I have a defender that can play pretty well um, or, or three defenders that can fit in with fairly good fixtures. And then I'll just trust them. If I need to make a defender transfer down the line, then I absolutely will. Um, but as it stands, it's not really my plan. So I've planned ahead a lot with defenders in particular. And also I've planned a lot with captains. I've always made sure I've got the big hitter in that I want for the captaincy. Far in advance in sometimes, just to make sure that I've got them. Um, so I'm not suddenly getting to a week and thinking, oh God, well, I need this player and I don't have them. I haven't left myself in that situation. So planning, I've definitely ignored the noise this year. Maybe that'll be to my detriment next year. Maybe I'll miss loads of stuff. Um, I've not made early chances. I've not chased differentials for the sake of it. Uh, it doesn't mean I've not put lower owned players in. Take Kevin De Bruyne as a recent example. Uh, but I'm not looking for them for the sake of it. If a player is good and I think they're going to score points, they're highly owned, I do not care. Uh, and also, I've had a little bit of luck. Maybe next year it'll be worse. So another good question. Which five players would you transfer in slash keep in your team without fail until the end of the season? Now, the rest of this question said if you had a wild card in tap, but I'm assuming 
I took it as if you didn't have a wild card, right? I had to put them in now and you couldn't change them. At least that's how I took the question, right? Apologies, Chaz, if that's not how you meant it, but that's how I took it. And i got to be honest, this was difficult because as soon as I started knowing players, Dan, I, I, I made excuse, not excuses, but I was like, yeah, this player, if that, this player, if you've got this one. And so obviously this is going to depend on your team who you want to captain and stuff like that. Um, but I've, I've got five players and one forward, two defenders and two attackers. And I will caveat most of them, to be completely honest with you. So I'll start from the bottom, the man on screen, Antonio. West Ham's fixtures for the rest of the season are pretty good. In the short term, they're not as good as in the long term. But I definitely would want an attacker from West Ham. Am I, and I am still going to back Antonio over Lingard. I know people love Lingard right now. He's a midfielder, extra point for the clean sheet goal. He may outscore Antonio from now until the end of the season. But when it comes to strikers, I just think Antonio is the man. Obviously, there is a slight issue in the fact of his fitness. And he's not exactly a player that you can rely on for like 9, 10 game weeks in a row. Um, so that I would caveat that pick. But outside of that, I think he's great. With defenders, like I just said for the previous question, I definitely want to be looking at long-term fixtures. I think Chelsea's fixtures right towards the end of the season, like the last kind of three game weeks, are not ideal. But in the short to medium term, they're brilliant. So I would have to go for Azpilicueta. Now, for my own team, I've got Rudiger. Uh, and I do think he's a good pick. But if I had to pick one for definite till the end of the season, based on not wanting too many rotation worries, then it's probably Azpilicueta. For what it's worth, I don't think Rudiger's going to get rotated that much. But as we've already seen it, there is always that slight doubt in my mind. The second defender is Cody from Wolves. Now, it could be Tierney instead from Arsenal, because I've actually picked him. Um, and slightly better fixtures I just I, I don't know this thing about Arsenal's defense the fixtures are so good but do I fully trust it it's always like there's always a mistake there uh, Cody's also a little bit cheaper so I think Cody or Tierney I've put Cody on the list I think Wolves fixtures are just really good for the rest of the season interestingly maybe there's a reason not to pick Wolves defenders which we'll come on to in a minute which is like players on the beach um, and I do think someone like Tierney Arsenal are going to constantly be pushing for those top spots just in case they don't win the Europa League. So I've put Cody, but it could be Tierney. Um, and then another striker. Sorry, it's actually one. It's actually two strikers, one midfielder. The one midfielder I've picked is Mo Salah, right? I don't really want to get into a debate about whether he is a better pick than Fernandez. I know most people would pick Fernandez, and I was really close to putting him on the list. But when when I think about five players, I need to think about my captains. And I know on my own captains list, right, from now until the end of the season, I only think that Bruno Fernandes is the best captain in one week, which is game week 33, where he plays Leeds. But in that same week, Salah plays Newcastle. So it's not even like Bruno Fernandes is that far ahead. You could even argue that Salah is a better option than that week. Forget about form, right? We're talking about two really good players that are... Uh, uh, what what's the word reliable for getting points or well, they, they have the ability to get points right i know salah hasn't done it recently if you think salah is just now a bad player then fair enough you pick fernandez instead but i look at the fixtures for liverpool and i just think they're better than the ones for man united so i went for salah much to my detriment because i know people will kill me in the comments and not going for fernandez and the last one's harry kane again if i look at the list of players i want to captain from now until the end of the season Salah and Kane are on there. De Bruyne are probably a bit unlucky to make not make this list, but I do worry about Champions League rotation. I own I own him and Gundogan right now, and I am a little bit worried. So that is the five: Kane, Salah, Aspilicueta, Cody slash Tierney. I'm putting an Arsenal player in there. Don't hurt me in the comments, uh, and then Antonio as well. But let me know which five you would pick. Bearing in mind you have to put them in your team now, and you cannot transfer them out, or at least that's how I took the question. So question four, what lessons have you learned playing FPL which are important in the last stage of the season? So this, is, for example, is avoiding teams that have nothing to play for um, and stuff like that. And again, uh, I, I like these questions because they're kind of generic. You can talk about a lot of things, but also it's difficult to give generic advice because certain teams are different. Um, you know, sometimes the league is over way before. Sometimes it's not. Uh, I think... Avoiding teams that have got nothing to play for is a is definitely a cliche that's talked about a lot in the FPL community. I think there is some merit in there. Like there are some teams right now, I think of like Brighton and Wolves that are not very far off hitting that 40 point barrier. They're not going to get relegated, I don't think. And once they hit that, that you know, yes, okay, there's a bit more money the higher you finish at the league, but whatever to these clubs, it's not to the players, I don't know how important it is. Um, 
And so once they hit that target and they can't get into Europe anyway, like what does it matter? You could avoid those teams. I, I don't think... The one thing I would say is I don't think your opinion should massively change just based on like a team hitting 40 points. Like, right now, Crystal Palace are bad. When they hit 40 points, they're still going to be bad. Wolves have got good fixtures. Cody plays most games. When they hit 40 points, they'll probably still play most games uh, or he'll probably still start every single game. They'll probably still be quite a good defensive team. I think sometimes like a team might hit 40 points and they start conceding a few goals and we say that it's because they got nothing to play for, but it could just be one of those things, you know? So I, I don't massively avoid it. What I will say is, again, if we're looking at every season being different, this season's very different in that the, the top teams where, where we want to mostly target, like West Ham, the, basically the teams in the top half, right? West Ham, Arsenal, Man United, etc., whoever it might be in the top half of the table, um, they've pretty much all still got something to play for. So that is ideal. You want to target them anyway for the most part, and they've got something to play for. That's probably a good thing altogether. I do think rotation does become a thing for some teams based on their European um, matches and their league position. So I believe, and I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, when Liverpool were going for the Champions League and the league was pretty much won, um, they did rotate more often. Like Salah and Mane did start missing out more. Uh, and people that jumped off them did pretty well early on when they started getting through to like the quarters the ch- uh, and the semifinals and stuff like that. And I think with Man City, you know, I am worried as a Man City owner. And you can overthink this and just get rid of a player and they only like miss one or two games. But that can be quite big, especially if you're pinning captaincy hopes on them, for example. So Man City are in that kind of position where they've pretty much won the league and their second 11 is almost as good as the first 11 anyway. Um And they're still in the Champions League. So they may rotate, right? We might see De Bruyne play the Leicester game after the international break where he's already playing matches as well. Play the Leicester game, play the first leg of the Champions League, then miss the league game against Leeds, then play the second leg. That could happen. And as they get into the semi-finals, that might then happen again. Obviously, you've got to keep an eye on the fixtures because if there's like two or three games in between Champions League games, they're not going to miss all of those but man city are a worry for me and i do think we've seen that before like they rotate anyway man city let alone when they've got champions league which i think to them right now is bigger than winning the league anyway and that's already wrapped up but i do believe when liverpool in a similar position they started um rotating so that is something definitely to be learned and i've got two man city players in de Bruyne and gunner and i am a little bit worried i don't they're not going to suddenly start missing every match but it might be enough where I want to get rid of him, maybe do De Bruyne to Fernandes or whatever it might be. So, yeah, in terms of lessons learned, yes, sometimes it feels like teams are on the beach, but I wouldn't put too much emphasis on it. Definitely, like, I don't know if it gets talked about right now, but a lot of the times that you'll hear comments like, well, they're in the relegation zone, they're definitely going to tighten up in defence to stop conceding goals to win matches, but there's a reason they're in the relegation zone. They can't just suddenly tighten up their defence. They're conceding goals because they're bad, and they're probably going to get relegated, right? I wouldn't worry about things like that. So, yeah, we can definitely overthink the the nothing to play for, but I think in this particular season, and it definitely is worth thinking about this one because this is the one we're playing, the top half of the table have a lot to play for. They're the players we should be concentrating on anyway. I don't think we need to worry too much about the rest. So there we go. That's it for this one. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully it was useful. I wanted to like avoid, should I transfer in this player? What about these this team in particular? Because I'll talk about that in the game we preview. But I appreciate when you start trying to talk about generic advice and then say well generic advice is tough then you know maybe it's not the perfect answer but hopefully it gave you something to think about do give it a like if you enjoyed it and hit subscribe if you're new around here as well if you want to check out patreon there is a link in the description below loads of perks and benefits over there everyone that signs up goes up on the legends wall as well so thank you to everybody that has already signed up and is supporting the channel and lastly of course if you want to follow me and watch some games check out twitch.tv slash let's talk underscore gaming link in the description below for that as well uh, i will probably not have an fpl video tomorrow or saturday i don't think i'll have one on sunday instead then all the regular content next week including streams deadline streams and all that good stuff so hit that notification bell uh, once you've subscribed if you haven't already hit that like button and i'll see you again soon